<rire> ok, bon, on va commencer alors. Eh bien, bonjour à toutes et bonjour à tous. Donc aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir en séminaire Francisco Rocha qui, euh, qui a fait sa thèse, son doctorat à Manchester avec Nick Rogray et Chris Johnson. Et je pense qu'il va nous présenter des résultats, parmi les beaux résultats qu'il a obtenus durant, durant sa thèse. Et puis depuis, depuis eh bien, il, est, il est allé chez nos, chez nos collègues euh, nos collègues et amis donc, de Lusty à Aix-Marseille, sur lequel là-bas, je pense qu'ils continuent à faire des écoulements en milieu un peu, un peu complexe, des fuites complexes. Donc, euh, et ben, très bien, Francisco, à, à toi. Bonjour à tous. Et vous m'entendez là pour les micros ça, ça va Super. Et bonjour à tous et merci d'être là. Hein. Et pour le séminaire, moi, je vais passer au anglais. Donc. Euh, So as I was saying, thank you very much for the invitation, for the opportunity to show you a bit what I've been doing uh, since my thesis. And um, I would like, uh, so please interrupt me if you want to make questions, make some questions um, during the presentation, and feel free to make in English or in French as you like. So. Today, the story I would like to share with you, it's about the ability of dry granular materials to self-channelize when they flow down inclined planes. And, but before diving into this topic exactly, I would like to tell you a bit of my journey until this point. And I st everything started in Brazil, in Recife, where I did my undergrad and master's in physics. And on the supervision of Professor José Miranda, we were interested on the pattern formation in Heleshoff flows, where we've been try we tried to use some mode coupling analysis and weakly nonlinear analysis to propose mechanisms to manipulate Safman-Taylor instabilities. So either destabilizing classically unstable situ uh, stable situations or the opposite. This was a very theoretical work that we continue to, to work together. And more recently, with uh, Professor Eduardo Diaz and Pedro Anjos, we've been looking at the coupling between hydrodynamics and electrokinetics, and how this coupling can control like adhesion tests with Newtonian fluids, and control also instabilities in confined geometries. So then, after when I finished my master's in 2014, I spent two years in Recife in the Federal University of Pernambuco as a temporary lecturer. Um, and after that, I wanted to do something new, so I moved to a completely different place, Manchester in the UK, where I did my PhD under supervision of Nico Gray and Chris Johnson on dry granular avalanches. And during my PhD, we were mainly interested in the problem of self channelization in monodispersed flows. But I also been involved in different kind of problems where solid and liquid-like phases of the granular material coexist, and also problems where you have particles of different sizes, and then you have segregation that affects the formation of, for example, granular row waves that you see here. And this was particularly done in very close collaboration with James Baker and Sylvain Viroli, who was a postdoc in Manchester at the time, and we continue to work a bit in this kind of topic. But then, when I finished the PhD in 2020, I defended my, my thesis. So COVID was there, so I waited a little bit until things smoothed a bit, until before I moved to Marseille to do a postdoc with Henri Lucier, Joel Forte, and Blometzger on the hydrodynamics of shear thickening suspensions. So here, shear thickening fluids are quite interesting, and they are known for like decades now, since the early 30s. But it's interesting that the flow rules to describe this type of fluid that can be either fluid, liquid-like, or solid-like, depending on the stress that is applied to this material, the flow rules have been proposed just, let's say, six to seven years ago. So then the idea here was to use this type, these new, new flow rules to attack classical problems in fluid mechanics. So then here, the first problem we looked at, it was the drag force 
that a moving cylinder feels inside this type of materials. So we use this type of experimental configurations where you have a floating layer of cornstarch and water and floats on top of a very dense liquid. And this is the image that it's the field of view that you see from the bottom of the, the cell. And you see that for low torques, the fluid around the solid object, it's like a Newtonian, it's new to behave Newtonian-like, but as you go above a certain threshold, you see that there is this kind of pulses that propagate through the material. And these are actually, when you analyze the flow field, you see that these are actually what is called jamming front. So as the material here jam, it increases the stress in the neighbor layer, and then this is like a cascade mode that you have the propagation of this activation of frictional contacts that make the material become solid. And so coupling the inertia of the object with, that, with the inertia of the fluid, that transfer of angular momentum from the inertia, from the tool to the fluid via the jam in front, we could explain and predict what's the drag law that this cylinder feels when it's subjected to different applied torques. And in the same spirit, we moved with the same experimental configuration. Now we analyzed the drag force of a translating cylinder. And you see that, again, it looks like a fluid, but as it goes above a certain threshold, boom, you see that now you have this, we call this race. And this race, it's like a very focalized front that connects the object to the, to the wall. And then you see that it builds up a huge amount of stress that you even cavitate and then it's took. It's when the stress is released in the material. And what we see here actually is that when you analyze the flow field around the object, you see that even when the stress at the level of the cylinder goes above the threshold, you don't see this front. What you see instead is that the effective size of the object increase, so you have a larger and larger object, until the effective object completes the, com the full orbit here, and then it becomes unstable, and you see this race. So this is, we are still characterizing this, but then I just finished this postdoc in 2022, and from the 1st of January, I started, I really liked Marseille, in UST, so I stayed, I started a new postdoc there, now with Maxime Nicolai and Olivier Pouliquin, and the idea here is to study the rheology, the bulk rheology of cohesive granular materials. So this is a big collaboration between uh, UST, the L'Institut de Physique de Nice, the Laboratoire d'Ingénierie de Matériaux Polymères à Lyon, where the idea is to synthesize particles where we can control the stiffness, the adhesion between the particles, and, and characterize these with atomic force microscopy type of things. And at UST, we're going to try to build a new pressure imposed rheometer to try to access the friction, the bulk friction, or the bulk rheology of these materials. So this is where I am now. We are at this point, playing around to see how we can make these things in a proper way. But to, this brings me to a different type of project that I've been looking very recently in a different collaboration with people from Brazil, Professor Rodrigo Soto in Chile, and Professor Peter Solich in Germany now, where we've been looking into run and tumble particles, which are active particles that can change directions uh, in a random way, with a probability alpha, with a tumbling rate alpha. And we know that these type of particles, they tend to agglomerate, to form clusters. And the idea here was to say, okay, what's the effect in the clustering dynamics if we consider that these particles, they are polydispersed? So if they move with different speeds, and in, in this work particularly, we're looking at dispersity in persistence velocity. So this is, uh, I just wanted to mention this because it's the type of research activity that I've been involved with. And this now brings me to the topic of the talk specifically, which is, as I said, the ability of granular materials to self-channelize when they flow down inclines. 
And I would like to go through three examples, which is self-generalization in a monodispersed flow. So the particles are really well sieved, so you can consider it as a monodispersed material. Then I will try to use what we learned from here to try to gain some insight on the polydispersed flow, so if you have particles of different sizes. And I would like to finish with an example of an avalanche over a cone. So this is not an inclined plane, then you have a cone, which can be completely different from what we see in the, in the inclined plane. So to start, let me show you this, very, this large scale experiment, which was performed in the US Geological Survey, where there is a flow of a mixture of gravel and water that flows down this 80 meters long chute. And when the material comes out of the gate, the first thing that for me you see is that, okay, it spreads a little bit out of the gate, but very rapidly the edges of the flow solidify and confine the flow in its interior. And what they've done is that they injected at the gate particles of different colors at, at, at different lateral positions to see exactly where, what's the trajectory of these particles or how they what's their life before they are deposited, kind of thing. This kind of self generalization with constant width events, it's quite widely seen in nature. So you see this in pyroclastic flows, but you also see in snow avalanches that come from a point source and divide in very parallel sided channels. This is quite striking because the width is very constant. But you also see in rock falls on the moon. So this is an image from the moon that you see these fingers, which for me, it's the thing that remembers more at like the lab, what's in the lab, it's what you see in the moon, on the moon. And in this geophysical context, these boundaries that solidify and confine the, the flow in its interior are called the levees. So when I mention the levees here, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about these walls, solid walls. But all these flows that I'm showing you, or that I've shown you here, they are extremely complex. So here you have cohesion, you have interstitial fluids, you have effects of the temperature, you have polydispersity, many things. So today, in the, I would like to start by talking about what are the minimum ingredients that we need to have to generate a self-generalized flow in the lab. So what are the, physical, the basic physical mechanisms responsible for that? So to do this in the lab, I'll go back. So in go, to, to do a self generalized flow in the lab is quite simple. You just need to inject a granular material, in this case it's red sand, that you inject through a funnel in a plane which is roughened. In this case, we roughen by gluing glass beads. So then the global dynamics can be divided in three stages, which is the front propagates down slope continuously. Eventually, a steady state is reached and this width it's selected. And this, I would like to say, that is very particular to granular flows. If you do the same thing with viscous fluid, the Newtonian fluid, you see that the width of the flow increases as you go down the chute with a power that's been computed 3 over 7. And then, eventually, if you stop the inflow, what you see is that the material drains out. This was not synchronized, so it's uh, loud now. So it drains out and leaves behind this fingerprint of the flow that it was sustained before there, the fingerprint of this elevate channel. So this is the global dynamics. But if we look closer, even when the steady state is already achieved, you see that you can have small adjustments in the levee position, for example. If you look closely to the boundary between static and flowing layers, what you see is that there is a lot going on here. As if there is a dynamical equilibrium all the time to see if this interface between flowing and static are in the same place. And if you change the flow field, the, the mass flux, by just closing a bit the funnel, what you see is that the material responds, the flowing width responds quite rapidly to this change in, in flow rate. So what you see, and I think it's, uh, it's what uh, uh, one of the things that has been shown by the work of Stephanie is that there is a really well-defined steady state for the moving channel according to, the, to each mass flux. So, as I said just now, there is a, there is a, a lot of studies uh, before uh, 
what I'm telling you has been studied before, so let me tell you a bit about the recent history of self realization in the lab. So I would say that this all starts in 2004 with Felix and Thomas, where they did experiments with monodispersed glass beads, and they characterized the, the, character, the properties of the, the channel, and they found that the width of the moving channel increases linearly with the mass flux, but interestingly, the thickness of the flow doesn't change with the mass flux. So the channel gets wider, but it doesn't get deeper. And in the same way, the velocity in the center line doesn't feel too much the, the change in the mass flux, but it saturates for, a, for, a, for, high mass, for, for high flow rates. And then in 2006, the work by Stephanie and collaborators show that, in fact, if you do these experiments with glass beads, you have a long time creeping flow that enlarges the width of this flow, of these channels, which in 2011, the, uh, Takagi, McElwain, and Herbert, they show that if you do the same experiment with angular beads of sand, you actually rapidly reach a steady state, and this steady state can be sustained for hours and days, as long as you keep the flow going. This is from the experimental side, and from the numerical side, there is the work of Anmanjine and collaborators, which was used a depth average model including frictional hysteresis in the, in the granular rheology to show that it, you don't need polydispersity or interstitial fluids to generate self centralized flows or levees. So basically what they shown is that hysteresis was enough to create this coexistence between solid and liquid-like of, of the material. But they were unable to predict the lab experiments, and they said that this was maybe due to some uh, lack of lateral dissipation within the channel. So then here, I would like to, what I'd like to, to discuss now is why do we need this lateral dissipation and how it becomes, it, it's, it brings the selection mechanism to select these equilibrium states of this channel. So to do this, we use as well a depth average model, where the avalanche is described by a mass conservation and a momentum balance, where you have the acceleration terms, you have the pressure, you have a source term which takes into account gravity that pulls the material down and friction, which holds, and you have this higher order that looks like a viscous-like stress that is derived from the, the mu of areology, let's say, so it doesn't bring any, any extra parameters. So all the parameters involved in this term comes from the granular rheology itself. And then the, the, the fun part, or let's say, or the intriguing part related to granular materials are embedded in this friction coefficient mu b, which in this problem, it's crucially that it's crucial that we incorporate hysteresis, so we want to have solid and liquid-like phases in the same flow. So the question is like, how do we how do we incorporate that? Classically, how do you how do you characterize this friction law? You use steady uniform flows in an inclined plane, where the thickness and the velocity of the flow is constant, so you guarantee that friction balances gravity exactly, and you can access the friction coefficient. But the question is like, how do we do, do you incorporate hysteresis on that? And the first to propose a way to, to incorporate hysteresis in the friction law was Pulikan and Forte in 2002, where they said, okay, if we do experiments with steady uniform flows, we have this data point here. We, we can relate the thickness and the fruit number of the flow, the normalized velocity, and we can find this branch where friction balances gravity exactly in a flowing state. If we do failure experiments, so to see what's the mass maximum thickness of, of a column that can be held in an implied, you can construct this other stable equilibrium branch, which is the static branch. But you see that data points you have here, you have data points here, but in the middle you have a lack of data points. And this is because when, you, when the flow gets quite slow, you start having a zoology of instabilities that you cannot 
really access this, this equilibrium between gravity and friction. So what they've done, they said, okay, we're going to use a, a power law extrapolation that links this point, which is the deposit H-top, to the maximum thickness, which is roughly 2 H-top. And they've done it in this way. But here, what we propose, we propose just a slight modification, which is, okay, what the data points tell us is that the transition between dynamic and, or, let's say, points and no points happen, happens a little bit for thicker layers and for higher fruit numbers. So instead of transitioning here, we're going to make the transition a bit earlier. And I don't have time to show you, but we did some experiments where we can access indirectly what should be the power law or the power law exponent of this connection. And then we propose this change where we have this, um, let's say, this stronger transition from the dynamic to the static um, state. So, okay, so we're going to input this law into our continuum model, and we'll try the first thing, we'll try to solve the equations using a finite volume scheme. And this is what we get. This is the, the colors here represent the velocity, and the colors here represent the thickness of the flow. And what you see is that the first thing is like, okay, it looks like a self-channelized flow. You have the front. You have a, a very constant width that's established in the, in the flow. And if we, you measure the velocity field at a given position, you see that when the front passes by, everything is mobile, so everything is moving. But very, very fastly, it converges to a steady state velocity profile. And if we measure the thickness, we see that during the steady state, the thickness is constant, but as it drains out, when we stop the inflow, the material drains out, leaving behind the super elevated levees, just like we see in the experiment. We also can try to do the changes in the mass flux to see these transitions between steady state, and we see we can recover quite uh, similarly to the experiment with the simulation. But then the question now is like, okay, we can do the time evolution of this, but can we understand a bit more about what sets this steady state, this equilibrium state? So when we look to this, when the steady state is established, what you see is like, okay, you have a channel which is basically invariant of X and is steady. So you do, you seek for solutions like this and mass balance, it, ba mass balance tells you that you don't have any lateral motion. Everything is moving downward and doesn't depend on X. So you have a velocity field that is a only downward component that depends on the lateral position. If you plug this back on the momentum balance, you get that the thickness in the moving channel should be constant. And this we can discuss. But uh, although it's constant, we don't know what should it be. So it's, it's an unknown parameter. And if we plug this into the downslope momentum balance, you get a force, an equilibrium force balance, which is just a balance between gravity, friction, and these lateral viscous stresses. And if we look to this closely, this is a second order boundary value problem with two unknowns, which is the thickness, we don't know how deep the flow should be, and we don't know where the boundaries are. But it turns out that we have three independent boundary conditions one symmetry condition, so we assume that the, the flow is symmetric at the center line. Um, and we have a constraint which relates the amount of material going down the channel with the thickness and the, the velocity profile, which is a volume flux constraint. And with this, we can close the system of equation and solve what should be the profile, the velocity profile for different mass fluxes. And we can check that the, 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 the time-dependent solution is indeed converging to our exact numerical solution, to, to our numerical solution, let's say, to our steady-state solution. And at this point, just before, see, because this, okay, it, it matches with our time-dependent, but it doesn't say anything if it matches with the experiment. So, but before telling you this, let me say why this term is quite crucial why you need this lateral, lateral viscous stress. Because this, let's, let's do everything in, in terms of this coefficient nu. 
if you if you put this guy to zero, this coefficient to zero, it makes a singular perturbation because the equation is not anymore a differential equation, but it becomes an algebraic equation, where friction balances gravity everywhere. So as a consequence, the velocity should be either zero or a single velocity across the channel, a uniform velocity across the channel. So you should, there is, I mean, you end up with just one equation, which is the constraint in the volume flux to determine two quantities, which is the width and the velocity of the flow. So you cannot determine the problem uniquely. So basically, the, your problem becomes degenerate, and you, you have infinitely many solutions, basically. This is the, why this, this lateral stress brings the selection mechanism for the steady state, but let's see if it compares with the experiments. So first, we compare with the experiments of Felix and Thomas with glass beads. And what we see is that the thickness of the flow matches quite well, I would say. Although the width, when we compute the width, it seems that we are overestimating by quite a lot the experiments. And these are the comparison with the full profile, where the lines are the steady state solutions and the data are depicted in the, in the dots. But this could be consistent with the observation that this channel for glass beads, they have a long time creeping flow. So this saying that this thickness could increase in time. But so let's see what it does for the experiment of sand. And then when we do this, we see that both width and uh, thickness and width of the flow, they match way better than for glass beads. If it's this long creeping lateral flow, we don't know. We need to be done some experiments to see if at long times it will approach the, 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 the our steady state solutions. But so this is, it, it was quite nice when we saw this. And there is another thing that our solution tells us, which is for low enough mass fluxes, where this dashed right line starts, the theory tells us that the solution should become unstable. And this is what we get when you do experiments in this regime. First of all, it's not steady at all. You don't have the front. And you have instead that the granular, the granular front propagates. As soon as it sees the base, it stops and brrr, it sends back this deposition wave that brings all the material to a halt. It piles up near the source until it goes above the angle of avalanche and triggers again a new pulse. And then we said, OK, let's try to do the same thing in the simulations. We just reduce the mass flux of the point source. And this is what we get. So you get basically a very similar scenario to the experiment. And the colors here, it represents the velocity. So what it says here is that everything in between the poses are blue. So it means that there is a static material, as we see here in the experiment, that everything is static. If we compute the thickness and the velocity of the flow in the center line, you see this, the blue is the thickness and the red is the velocity. So what you see, if you get the thickness profile at a given position in time, you recover exactly what Takagi, Michael, and Huppert have seen the experiment, which is that these pulses become extremely periodic. So they have a very well-defined period between each pulse. So here we can recover as the same thing in that in the experiments, although we have a mismatch in the period. So the simulations, we see that the period is, that there is a factor two between the period between simulations and experiments. And I think this is because this failure here close to the source is a really three-dimensional effect that we cannot capture with depth average because it means there is a pile which doesn't, it's not at all shallow, let's say. So this brings me to the conclusion of this first part, which is, okay, we think with the experiments and simulations in theory that we did suggest that hysteresis and lateral viscous stress are the key mechanisms to produce levate channels with a well-defined steady state. Here, hysteresis is incorporated via non-monotonic friction law where we have two stable branches and one branch which is unstable 
that we observe indirectly. And I didn't show you how I observed this indirectly, but uh, if you want, we can discuss that after. And then this model is also able to produce this unsteady regime. So this was, we were quite happy, let's say, when we saw that. But when you look for realistic flows, like these, for example, debris flows, what you see is that in the flow, there is a wide variety of particle size. So it's not at all monodispersed. In this work, apart from the people I already mentioned, this is the work in collaboration with Andrew and uh, Peter Kokla. So in natural debris flows, what you see is that normally you see a front, which is quite uh, wide populated by large particles, which also populate the outer part of the levees, and the bulk flow, the channel that comes behind, it's populated between a mix of large and small particles. And this in the lab was also studied by Pitt and collaborators, where they did experiment with bidispersed materials, and they use a resin to kind of collect the, in, to see the internal structure of the flow. And they see that, okay, you have a large, rich top and outer part of the levees, but you also have small particles inside the levees. And they said that this can bring a secondary mechanism to, to, to kind of lubricate the flow, decrease the friction, and make the run out of this hazardous flow to be longer, let's say. So the idea here is to say, can we gain some insight about this segregation, about this pattern, using the solutions we collected from the monodispersed case? So what we do, we get, we produce one steady solution, and when we move to a frame where the solution, this shape, is preserved, is steady. So we do this, and by do, and we can also suppose that we can reconstruct the three-dimensional velocity profile by using a shear profile that we use a bag node-like profile here, and we use incompressibility to reconstruct the full three-dimensional downslope, lateral, and vertical velocity profile. So we get something like this. In the lab frame, you have static levees and the channel which is moving. This is surface velocity. When you move to a frame where this is steady, the, the channel move forward, but the levees move backwards. And then we can construct the, also the streamlines. And this is what we get for the vertical structure of the flow, where here, for example, you see this dashed white line that defines above this line, everything is moving towards the front, so moves to, uh, faster than the front. And below this, everything moves slower than the front. And then we can use this velocity profile to solve for the segregation pattern. So what we do is like, since we are in a bidispersed mixture, we have one closer relation, so we just need to solve for one of the concentrations. And we use an advection segregation diffusion equation where the concentration that can be advected, they, it can be a segregation which is in the direction of gravity, so it's gravity in this segregation. And in the general case, you can suppose that there is a diffusion there. Here, we simplify a bit things, and we say that, okay, let's assume that we are in the shallow limit, so we can discard some terms which are small when the thickness of the, the avalanche is it's small compared to other length scales. And we suppose that there is no diffusivity for simplicity, so we can track exactly each type of particles. So we get this type of equation, this type of equation, which depends on this function f s small large, which is just the magnitude of the velocity of segregation. That depends on the shear rate, on the particle ratio, the ratio between large and small diameters, and on this average diameter, which is just the weight average diameter of the flow. These constants A, uh, B, and C, they are found empirically. So we do experiments. In this work, particular of Trilla and collaborators, what they did is they did experiments of shear box cells, and they found what should be this, this uh, Okay, but then we can solve this, this we can solve this equation numerically, and we get this. So dark 
represents large particles and bright represents small particles. So what you see is that basically large particles segregate to the top where the velocity is larger. They are then transported to the flow front and they recirculate here. Whereas, and in the same way, laterally, when they do this, they come to the front, they are advected to the side, and they populate the outside of the elevation. Small particles, on the other hand, they segregate down, and they populate the bulk of the central region, as well as the internal part of the elevation. So this looks quite nicely uh, similar to the experiments, and we can actually try to track each, uh, each particle trajectory. And we just solve using the velocity profile. And what we see is that small particles, as we said before, small particles that come in in the center of the channel, they recirculate and come back to the, to the bulk. But if they come in in the edges of the flow, they are advected to the internal part of the elevation. On the other hand, large particles that come in in the center, they are overrun by the front, they have a swirl here, and they are deposited before they are deposited at the outer side of the levees. But large particles that come in in the edge, they have a very short moving life, and they just are advected to the side and populate and are deposited at the levees. So with this, we can construct the trajectory of each type of particle. So this brings me to the conclusion of this part. And this uncoupled model, and why do I say uncoupled, is because we impose the velocity field to solve the segregation. But the segregation can affect the velocity field. We are, here we are not considering that. We are imposing the velocity field. But even in this uncoupled way, we can see that large particles form this carapace, this protection to the levees, but they also populate the top part of the central channel. Whereas small particles, they populate the center of the channel, but also the internal part of the elevation. So we can corroborate the idea here that there is this fine lining uh, of small particles close to the elevation that, that decrease the friction and can provide a secondary mechanism to longer runouts. And we can say here as well that particle size segregation is not at all required to generate levees, but it can have a feedback and enhance mobility and strong and make the levees stronger of the flow. So with this, I conclude this story of the bi-dispersed particles. And to finish, if there is no question yet, I will go to the last problem I would like to mention, which started in the PhD thesis of Parmesh Gajah. Uh, and it's about a granular avalanche over a conical surface. So you have a cone. We have a spring-loaded gate that we can control the aperture of the cone. And we just sieve the materials until we say that they are monodispersed, and we generate the flow. And we see this. So we see that initially the flow is axisymmetric. Eventually, the granular front becomes unstable and breaks into this series of fingers which I find quite beautiful. And each finger, if you look closely, there is the morphology, morphology of a self channelized flow. So you have the levees, and you have a central channel, which is confined. We can, you can do this for different mass fluxes, different, basically different apertures of the gate, to see that the phenomenon is the same. But the critical radius to break the interface it's larger for higher fluxes, and the numbers of fingers that reach the bottom of the cone is larger when the flow is larger. When the flux is larger, so, sorry. So, first of all, we are not expecting this at all. We are just, when we did this, the idea was to say, okay, let's go to a more close to a mountain like geometry, because the cone is more like a, a mountain than a plane. So, what is the difference between the cone and the inclined plane that makes this finger to appear. So let me just, if we get the same material and we do the experiments on, on the plane, this is what we see. The front is stable through transverse perturbation. You don't see any, any finger or anything. Since the work of Pulikandelo Savage in 97, 
we know that you can generate granular fingers if you do have particles of different size. So the large particles go to the front, it provides an uh, increase in local friction at the front that becomes unstable and breaks in this kind of fingers. But why do, do, does it happen on the cone for monodispersed flows? So the first thing that we can do is to track the front to see that the first difference is on the inclined plane, the front propagates with a constant velocity, whereas on the cone, for the same aperture, it starts with the same velocity as on the, on the plane, but it slows down as a consequence of the area increasing. So this is okay, we can do a bit more mathematically, and we seek for steady axis symmetric solutions. And mass balance, mass balance tells us basically that the flow should thin and slow down as it goes down the curve. And of course here, as it is steady and axisymmetric, we are forgetting a bit about the front. We just want to see steady axisymmetric solution, how they look like. And if you put this back on the momentum balance, it tells us that during the axisymmetric spreading, you have a balance between gravity and friction. With this, you can compute what's the velocity, the radial velocity, at each position, which gives us the spreading dynamics. We can integrate this to get the spread dynamics. So just with this, it gives us a hint that if we think in terms of this non-monotonic non -monotonic friction law, if you generate a flow at the gate here, it will come down this line, walk along this line, because it's a balance between gravity and friction. But there is a point where it should, friction should start to, to enter the intermediate regime, where it should be unstable. So then we try to check this hypothesis. We do the experiments for different fluxes, and we track the position of the tip of each finger, and also of this knuckle, I don't know, this point, the minimum point of each finger. And what you see is that you have a quite nice order for different fluxes, and increase the flux. And actually that when the interface breaks, these points, they actually completely stop. They are not creeping downwards. They are static for a very long time. <clears throat> so, okay, so we can use, this is not at all collapsed, but we can use the scaling of the axisymmetric solution, and we see that there is a quite nice collapse of the data. And we can use this idea to find, since we know the dynamics, to find when or at which radio position friction will start to behave in this intermediate way. And we can define then the critical radius, which is defined, which is given here, I'm showing you in the gray line. So it recovers quite well the trend from what we get in the data, but you do have an offset between data and, and uh, between theory and experiment. We thought, okay, this could this can be the the length of the front, because this axisymmetric solution it doesn't consider they don't consider the front. So what we do, we try to do the simulations to see if the length of the front gives us this offset. And this is what we get in, in the simulations in the same, using the same scheme, but in a conical coordinate. So you get this, and you get this kind of final pattern, which looks qualitatively similar to what we see in the experiments. But there is a, there is a down, not a downside, but there is a pitfall, let's say, here. And I'm going to mention the pitfall in the next slide, which I conclude. It's... So we see that, in contrary to what we, we know from the inclined plane, monodispersed fingers can indeed happen. We can see finger instability in monodispersed avalanches. But what is, we suggest here is that this instability is induced by hysteresis. So as soon as friction enters the velocity weakening part, it becomes unstable and breaks down into these fingers. Using this kind of uh, scaling analysis, we can predict the initial axisymmetric spreading, as well as the critical radius, quite nicely with the experiments. And we can reproduce time dependently what we see in the experiments, but we need to modify a little bit the friction law. So if we use this piecewise function, what we see actually, we don't see fingers, but we see that after the initial spreading, when friction enters this part, everything stops. So you see a pulsing regime that you have poof, 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 like this. And in order to see the break of symmetry here, we had to smooth out a little bit this friction law. 
So we are still doing some work on this, but what I think here is that the instability at the at the point where the interface breaks depends on the derivatives of the friction law to, with respect to the thickness and to the fruit number exactly at the point of instability. So basically you have this problem is quite sensitive that you need to have the good balance between driving and resistive forces in the instability point to generate this finger instability. But this is still, we are still doing some tests on what should be this functional form. And I think this crossover between dynamic and static in quasi static part of the friction law is still we there are still quite a lot to debate i mean we don't know exactly what should be the form so there is a lot to be done and with this i finished the 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 part that i would like to tell you about the self generalization and just in the last 15 seconds i would like to mention to you some perspectives what i would like to do in the future like now and i would like to divide this in two groups so the first one it's about how cohesion change these uh, dry avalanches on on inclined planes and envisaging, let's say, to to understand to to go towards more geophysical and industrial flows. And this I would like to divide in three stages, where I would like initially to understand what's the role of cohesion in well-known instabilities in dry avalanches. So, for example, in row waves or shear instabilities, as you increase cohesion step by step, how does the situation change. And then I would like to go to the crossover between inertial and quasi-static regimes to see this coexistence between static and flowy regions. And also maybe towards more complex geometries such as the flow over a bump where you can see these hydraulic jumps or, or, or shocks uh, depending on the initial configuration, but also something like split bottom cells which are quite relevant to industry. In the second part, to finish, I go back to the very beginning of my talk, where I talked about manipulating hydrodynamic instabilities. But then I used just a theoretical approach. Here I would like to go to more experimental numerics, but I would like to dive also into this, how we can control finger instabi or instabilities in, in fine geometries using electrosmotic flows and more specific electric fields. So this could can be done for example, to the lifting Hellershaw problem or to the rotating Hellershaw problem. And this is aiming to control instabilities. But then we can also do the opposite and trigger finger instabilities by using particles. And this was done, this experiment is done by the group of Song Yong Li in Minnesota, but they, con they focused on very dilute regimes. So what I'd like to see is like, what does happen when you go to dense regimes? where contact dynamics may play a quite big role. And with these, I thank you very much for the attention. And thank you very much for, for this nice talk. Uh, <laughs> cool. So maybe some questions in the, the assistance? Steph. Euh, ouais, merci, c'était très intéressant. Euh, ah oui, je me demandais, donc c'est vrai que souvent on va regarder où, euh, où on est en écoulement et on ne va pas euh, dans la zone statique ou l'inverse. Et du coup, je me demandais, donc ce que tu, per tu permets de voir vraiment les deux, est-ce qu'il y a d'autres travaux qui, qui permettent de, de deviner comment euh, on transite là de la rhéologie euh, local, mu de i au, au statique. Je ne sais plus. Je, je euh... ah. Peut-être pas. Hein. So, maybe I'll show you something else. Ah, sorry. So this is the experiment we did to access the, the unstable part of the break. So what we do, we create an avalanche and we, we wait for the deposit. And then we incline a little bit so it's in a metastable regime, but it's still static. So it's here and then we perturb. And what you see, you see this backward propagating wave that erodes the material and moves everything. Here you see these quite nice waves but what you see is that you have a traveling wave solution 
backward propellant. And what you see is that this exactly connects the static to a dynamically equilibrium state. And we can match the shape of this wave and also see what the wave speed for different variations in the angle. And you see what should be the, the functional form of that unstable branch to have a nice match with the experiment. So this is how we indirectly access that term. But the problem here is that we are already assuming that there is an Euler extrapolation of piecewise function. So for now, the cone experiment is it's what I saw close, that goes more into the direction of like exactly the transition and it's more sensitive to this. But one thing that could be done is, for example, if you use silica particles in water and you can tune the friction from a frictionless to a frictional case, so you can suppress completely hysteresis and to see if it's really investigated. But then the, the other question is like, how far can we go assuming that the suspension is incompressed? So not considering that there is change in phi, for example. This is something that I don't know exactly. Yeah. Oui, merci, c'était très intéressant. Tu, tu as mentionné le, le fait, la plupart de la modélisation que tu fais est basée sur modéliser la friction euh, plane, enfin dans des écoulements moyennés verticalement. Euh, est -ce, et tu as montré aussi des distributions 3D de de recirculation de particules. Est-ce que tu penses que, euh, tu, disons, est -ce que tu peux commenter sur quels sont les effets que tu penses pouvoir capturer uniquement en écoulement moyenné sur la friction yes. et Quels effets euh, tu penses ne pas pouvoir capturer s'il faut vraiment que tu ailles à de la friction 3D on va dire, couplée avec l'écoulement yes. uh, so back here. The thing is that... You cannot. One thing that you cannot yet capture with the three with a three D rheology or with a three D model is the coexistence between flowing and static region. Because basically, when as one way that's been proposed by Mathieu Viard and Eric de Julie is to do a non-monotonic friction law. But as soon as you do this, the model becomes imposed. So you you see all sorts of numerical weirdness going on here. So this is basically why we go to depth average modeling because we, this coexistence so for now we, we need this. But there are, for example, I mean, this column, the accumulation of the particles there, we cannot get because of the three-dimensional effect. There is also, for example, the curvature in the thickness here that is not at all constant. This is a three with, I think is a three-dimensional effect that people have tried to model using second or the fluid like with Ericsson tensor and blah blah. I don't really understand exactly how it's done, but I think it's more like a three-dimensional effect than than a different kind of fluid, let's say. So this would be my exact my immediate answer now. Salut, merci beaucoup pour euh, ta super présentation. J'ai une question qui est certainement très, très euh, naïve, si ce n'est idiote. Euh, tu utilises des billes de verre euh, sur le fond de euh, la plaque, euh, ton substrat. Euh, si tu avais un substrat complètement lisse, oui. est-ce que tu aurais toujours ce, euh, cette largeur constante ou ça s'étalerait complètement euh... C'est complètement différent. So here, what you have, when you have a smooth base, you don't have, you have one friction coefficient that stays in equilibrium. That you have one, one angle where you can have steady flows, basically. So you don't have at all hysteresis. And it's actually exactly this interaction between the, the friction between the flow and the base that creates this, uh, this interesting behavior. If you have a smooth, so if you have, uh, I go like this, huh? Uh, where is it? So if you have 
there is this work by uh, Sylvain Virole, the people in Manchester. What they do, this is a flow over a bump with a smooth base. So basically, you have an accelerating flow if you are not in the exact angle that friction is balancing gravity. So the situation is completely different. But you can rough with a different thing. You can rough with sandpaper or sand, or any, it doesn't need to be glass beads to have this. I don't know whether. Thank you for the present, very nice presentation. I got another uh, maybe naive question. I'm not a granular guy at all, but can you show us, please, uh, one of the flows with the with the red beads on the substrate, even the ones that you had before? Because I'm mostly an instability guy, so I see what you say, what yeah. So what do I want? What do I want? I show this because it's why you can. See Isn't there a traveling wave or happening? At the front? No, not at the front. In the bulk, in the sense that even in the, yes, isn't there a traveling wave? There's some some coherent structure that is happening because actually it doesn't look like just random noise. No. It seems by the eye, of course. I, I cannot do FFTs by eye, <laughs> but uh, it looks like there's some kind of uh, characteristic structure that is occurring. So it's it's a very short wavelength. Yeah, very robust. Yeah. It but is it's very, very robust. robust. It's very dependent on the material itself. Mm. So if you do the same flow with glass beads, you see a much smoother interface. Is and and I I question myself exactly the same, but. We didn't have time, but I think it's quite interesting to know why. And the thing is, like, why do you have this, but this doesn't affect the overall structure? So I think I tried to do, for example, to impose this shape and to do a stability analysis mm. on the flow, but then I I didn't have time to finish. So, but this is this is it's a very good question because you got the mean flow that is a maybe a base flow even in your yep. case. And you could impose and see from stability analysis point of view. So it would be in linear stabi stability analysis on your uh, average uh, yes. equations and uh, could tell you why. Because it's very fancy. It's extremely interesting to see that by time to time you can have even uh, uh, perturbation that go goes uphill that is uh, uh, in the opposite direction as uh, for the flow. Yes. So as if when you got uh, uh, elliptic flows, flows in an elliptic regime, and in this case, you it seems like you cannot have perturbation. Can you have in this per in this regime, this very one, perturbation that goes uphill? I haven't seen this in experiments, although in the simulations I've seen something uphill. Uh, we can discuss about yes. this later. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, so oh, well, I have several questions, but uh, I will ask them. <laughs> no, no, I have several questions. Yes, 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 yes. Sure. So thank you very much again, uh, Francesco. Thank you all very much.